Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Youngquist, and I work with the University of Wyoming Extension. Composting can be a great way to deal with livestock mortalities on the farm and butcher waste. Uh, it has the advantage of reducing scavenger pressure, uh, reducing disease transfer from dead animals, and recycling nutrients on the farm. Wyoming regulations state that um, when an animal dies, you must remove the carcass uh, at least half a mile from the nearest human habitation and bury it with not less than two feet of soil over it. Uh, the good news is that composting um, animal mortalities on farms, ranches, and exempt animal feeding operations is allowed in Wyoming per DEQ regulations and Department of Agriculture. The DEQ requires, the Department of Environmental Quality requires that non-exempt compost facilities are permitted as low volume, low hazard solid waste facilities. The good news is that compost piles for green waste and manure operated in a manner that does not create odors, constitute a nuisance, or attract vectors are considered exempt. And if you recall from the previous slide, um, that includes uh, composting animal mortalities on agricultural operations. So keep that in mind. You are exempt if you're composting livestock mortalities. However, um, if, uh, if, if someone's interested in composting butcher waste, that does not fall under the exemptions and would require a permit from Wyoming DEQ as a low volume, low hazard solid waste facility. Another important thing to keep in mind is that the carcass of any animal that's been euthanized using sodium pentobarbital can poison dogs and wildlife. So fortunately the compost process will break this, uh, break this chemical down, but the carcass needs to be thoroughly buried and it need, you need to ensure that, there, that no scavengers will, will dig it up and um, eat it. So following the proper compost protocols is very, very important to prevent the death of wildlife or dogs. So compost is essentially the controlled aerobic degradation process in which microorganisms convert the carcass and any co-composting materials into a usable compost. Aerobic means that it requires oxygen um, and the co-composting materials that you need for this process are high carbon materials. So a carcass or a pile of butcher waste is very high in nitrogen, very wet, very dense, and is a very poor composting environment. So that's why mortality or butcher waste composting takes a lot longer than something like food waste, uh, green waste, or manure composting. And it needs to be left undisturbed for a longer period of time. So essentially the raw materials, which could be a dead animal or butcher waste, is mixed with some sort of high carbon uh, porous co-composting material. Chopped straw, chopped corn, sawdust, wood chips, um, shredded cardboard or paper, any combination of those materials to absorb a lot of the moisture and to provide the carbon that the microbes need in order to um, be biologically active and break down all the raw materials. So the microbes, the bacteria and the fungi involved in the compost process need uh, a certain ratio of nitrogen and carbon to thrive and to reproduce. Now, as I mentioned, carcasses and butcher waste are very high in nitrogen and very low in carbon, and so you need to offset that by having a high carbon absorbent material as your co-composting material. So, those, so once you mix all those materials together and the organisms have some air and some water and some food, they are going to reproduce very rapidly. And that rapid um, metabolism and reproduction is what causes the heat buildup in the compost pile. And that heat buildup is very, very important for pathogen reduction and parasite reduction um, and for killing weed seeds. So monitoring the temperature of the compost pile and making sure things are staying very hot is important to the process. They will also, because these organisms, microorganisms are aerobic, they will be consuming oxygen and putting off carbon dioxide. And heat, as I mentioned, is a byproduct, and maybe you'll see some steam. The other thing to keep in mind is that the raw materials that go into the compost pile, depending on what it is you're using, may contain some pathogens or parasites, weed seeds, and even pharmaceuticals. The good news is that the, the intense microbial activity in the compost pile will break down all of, all of these materials. And so that then produces a safe, stable, finished compost that can be used as a soil amendment, either on the farm or in the garden or landscaping. So again, it's a microbially mediated process. They need food, air, and water to create a high quality compost product. And I mentioned they need a balance of nitrogen 
and carbon. And so as you can see in this example, this picture of a cow, that cow is very high in nitrogen and very high in water, and the straw is an important piece of absorbing that and balancing those nutrients. The mortality compost process um, should give you a volume reduction of the final product by about a quarter to a third of the pile. And it, when it gets hot enough, it eliminates pathogens and parasites. And the process takes 2 to 12 months for large animals, depending on size, the materials used, the environment, and the desired quality of the final product. So keep in mind it takes time. And so make sure that you have enough space and space set aside that you can leave undisturbed for several months up to a year. This is the basic um, mortality compost process for one animal. A minimum of two feet of high carbon absorbent material on the bottom, sawdust, wood chips, shredded cardboard, um, shredded straw, any combination of that material, leftover feed, hay. That's very important and not to put any less than about two feet on the bottom. And then the animal or the, the carcass can go in the middle, followed by another two feet over the top. Again, that thick layer over the top is very, very important because that's what's going to eliminate odors that will attract scavengers. If you don't put enough material over the top, you have a high risk of scavengers um, smelling the decomposing carcass and then being attracted and digging in the pile. So two to three feet over the top is very important. Windrows can be used for larger animal feeding operations like feedlots. They um, should run up and down the slope to allow for drainage. Don't drive over the materials as that compacts it and drives out the oxygen. So just continue adding mortalities to the pile as they occur and record the date and location. Smaller animals can be stacked together. Larger animals like cattle and horses need to be, stacked, need to be placed alone with plenty of material around them. So keep in mind this can be a very um, useful and relatively simple management process for mortalities that um, eliminates scavengers, eliminates pathogens, and keeps nutrients cycled on the farm. This is an example of that layout. This is, a, this is at a feedlot. Um, a steer that died at the feedlot lay on a base of uh, straw and manure and wood chips. This is shredded pallets. And you can see that it was then covered and that and um, animals were added as they died. So that can be a very simple management process. This is an example of a single dairy cow. This is a cow based on, laid on a base of wood chips and straw and then covered with a mixture of manure and more straw and then topped off with a layer of separated dairy solids. So basically sort of drier dairy manure. And this was a great combination of materials. It worked very well. This pile was constructed on November 1st and uh, was very, that was, and it was cold and it was still very warm in that pile, warm enough to melt the snow on top of the pile. Ten weeks later, we excavated that pile to see what was left. And again, you can see where the heat has melted some of the snow in that pile. There was a fair amount of steam and heat. You could see a little bit of the um, what was left, an ear tag and some bones, but there was not an unpleasant odor. And almost all of the animal was gone. And the bones that were left were actually quite soft. In this case, if you had multiple piles with different animals in them, after 10 or 12 weeks or, or longer, you could actually mix those piles up and combine them and then use some of this material again for the next compost pile. This is a, a trial with butcher waste. So this is some grain holes from a UW research project and some, comp, um, some cardboard that uh, was ready to be recycled that we were able to use for this project. A uh, truckload of butcher waste was, this is about a week's worth of butcher waste from this particular processor was dumped here and then completely covered with these grain holes. Again, high carbon, very porous material. And the pile got very, very hot. That showed us that there was a lot of biological activity. There are hides and skulls and feet and and offal in this pile, as you can tell. The challenge with this is we didn't have a big enough tractor. It was hard to get everything covered because of the reach of the of the arms on the tractor. So doing it in a windrow might be easier or having a tractor with a longer reach that would allow you to get um, the pile more spread out in, in a windrow so there was less density of the butcher waste in the middle and more um, mixing of the carbon material with the high nitrogen uh, 
waste. So there are certainly some methods that would make this easier. Wood chips can be a great material as well. So um, the first turn, when we first opened up this pile, it was 15 weeks later in November. And you can see uh, a lot has disappeared. All the, all the guts, organs, everything has com was completely gone. The only thing that was left was some bones um, and some skulls and parts of hides that were still decomposing. And that pile probably could have been left for another several weeks to a month. So after opening up that pile, we, we mixed, remixed it all again into a windrow and um, let it sit again. And the temperature a few days later was up over 150 degrees, again indicating a lot of biological activity. And you'll notice here in these pictures, the, the grain and the sawdust, um, grain holes and sawdust are still visible and have a lot of biological activity left in them. And so those could certainly be reused. Um, for the next mortality um, load, so to speak. So if a person were doing this um, on a large scale for a butcher shop, you just would add a load every week perhaps and keep recycling some of that compost and then keep adding fresh material as needed um, to get a, a, a good routine in terms of managing it and make it easy to manage. I've been doing a little bit of experimenting using worms, red wigglers. So red wigglers are commonly used for composting food waste or using converting food waste into worm castings that are very high quality soil amendment. So I've been experimenting a little bit with the butcher waste. Uh, we use shredded cardboard and sawdust in this particular project. One of the challenges with worms is that they don't they don't thrive in the heat. So a good compost pile should get up over 130 degrees. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, some of these uh, butcher waste or mortality piles and get up to 150 degrees. That's hot enough to kill the worms. However, they can move out to the edges of these piles where it's a little cooler. And in this case, I put the butcher waste in first, let it get through a first heat cycle, and let it cool off. And then after that, I added the worms. And they were very active in there. They were cleaning out the bones and eating all that was left. And so we're continuing to experiment with that. I think there is some potential there um, to, to use worms but it just takes a little bit more careful management and they do not tolerate the high heat that you might get in a typical compost pile. For those of you that compost food waste at home, you have probably heard um, never put fats or meats or dairy products uh, or anything like that in your compost pile. That's typically because it's a high risk of attracting scavengers if you're not managing your pile well. But as evidenced by um, by mortality and butcher waste composting, the microbes will eat anything. And so it's really just a matter of management. And uh, I, I compost all of my vegetable and fruit food scraps at home with worms, but I don't put a lot of meat food scraps in there just because of the odor, high odor potential uh, with the worm waste, co worm composting. But uh, managing it on a larger scale in these outdoor bins and experimenting a little bit, it certainly is possible. It just takes some careful management. So the microbes and the worms really will eat anything that was alive at some point. It's very important to monitor the process. Uh, take the temperature at least once a week or just leave a thermometer in the pile and watch it to make sure it's getting hot. And making sure you have the right moisture, it should be about like a wrung out sponge. Again, keep in mind that not everything is going to be exactly right in the whole pile because it's not a uniform mix. You have a, a core that is a carcass or a pile of butcher waste and an outer um, envelope that is high carbon and absorbent material. But again, trying to keep a, a good uh, level of moisture about like a wrung out sponge. And then watching for settling and disturbance, watching for digging in the pile. If you're composting carcasses, often what will happen is they will, as they collapse, um, the whole pile will sink in and so it will need more materials added on top. And once the scavengers find the pile, it's very, very hard to get rid of them. So the best bet is to keep from finding them in the first place. These are two resources that I highly recommend. Um, livestock mortality composting for large and small operations in the semi-arid west. This is a joint publication between several different um, universities. That can be found at the Western SARE western.sare.org website under resources. There are a tr tremendous amount of resources on that Western SARE website. I would encourage you to check it out. But this particular publication is available as a PDF and it comes with, um, there's some videos in English and Spanish as well. And then the Cornell Waste Management Institute has a lot of resources on um, natural rendering, what they call it, natural rendering, composting, livestock mortality, butcher waste. There's videos, there's, there's handouts, there's articles, there's 
posters, everything you could you could want. So I would highly recommend these two resources for more information on how to um, compost mortalities or butcher waste. And if I can be of assistance, please do let me know. We are doing a few trials around the state and we are especially looking for uh, custom meat processors that are interested in um, participating in some in some butcher waste composting trials. Thank you and best of luck.